Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and uh, I know we've got folks that have driven a good distance, Edmond and Oklahoma City and Jones. Boy, I don't dare miss Jones. And uh, some of you come from other areas, Muskogee, and we're just tickled to death to have all of you in the studio this afternoon. And then for those of you joining us on television, we welcome you. And uh, again, in case you're just a new listener, we are an informal Bible study. We uh, don't claim to be theological, I guess we could call it. We just simply want to search the Scriptures, compare Scripture with Scripture, and... Uh, Leave it at that. You know, I just told somebody as I was walking up here, you know, if people would just learn to read, but uh, they read without reading. And uh, that, of course, is where I'm a stickler. We're, we're going to take it word for word and uh, see what it says. For, again, those of you out in television, uh, we appreciate so much your letters, your financial help, and most of all, your prayers. My, how it thrills our hearts when we can read, when you tell us you're praying for us two, three times a day then uh, we're in pretty good hands. All right, this is a Bible study, and uh, we're just sort of taking it verse by verse. We are now in the book of Hebrews, and as we've got it on the board, we're in Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to jump in at verse 10. We finished in verse 9 in our last half hour. And uh, again, I think I have to keep reminding everybody that Hebrews is just like the title implies. It was written primarily to the Hebrew believers, but they were Hebrews who were fighting the pull back into Judaism. And, of course, anyone who has come out of a strict religion, whatever it is, can understand what that is. Because after years and years of just being indoctrinated in something, and then to suddenly see something better, as Paul constantly calls it in Hebrews, there's always that magnetic pull back to that old belief system. And so this is the whole idea of Hebrews, that yes, that which was in the past, Judaism, the law, the temple worship, it was good. After all, God ordained it. But everything now on this side of the cross, and after especially the revelations of Paul's mysteries, we now have something that is so much better. And so the comparison throughout the book of Hebrews is that Christ is better and higher than the angels. And uh, that one thing after another is better than that that went before. And as we've seen in the early chapters and verses here now, in chapter 1 and on into chapter 2, the apostle is showing the epitome of Christ and who he really is, how that he was the Son, and how that he was the one who will one day rule and reign on a new inhabited earth. That was up there in uh, verse 5, if I remember right. All right, but now we've been showing how that in the last couple verses of chapter 2, how that even though he was the creator God, he was the ruler of the universe, for a little while he took his position lower than the angels. In other words, he became man. And this is what we are looking at now in these verses, how that God, the Creator, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the man who has accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished, and in his death, he not only tasted death for us as believers, but for every human being who has ever lived. All right, so now then I think we can move on into verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, and to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now we're going to just stop with that verse and go back to the first few words. But it became him. Now, as I study this, I couldn't help but be reminded that so many of our little cliches, even in our everyday secular language, has a biblical origin. Now, I think you're all acquainted with our little uh, saying, well, it just becomes him to do what he does. It, it just becomes him to be the kind of a person that he is. Well, that's exactly what it means here. 
it became God to become the Savior of mankind. In other words, he couldn't help himself. He had such a love for those created creatures that he had started there in the Garden of Eden that the moment that they fell into sin, it just became him to express his love for them by setting up a plan of redemption. And that plan of redemption, of course, included his own suffering and death as a man. Now, he never lost his deity. Don't ever let anyone tell you anything other than that. He never stopped being God. Even in the womb, I'm convinced that he was God. But once he planted his feet on the dusty trails of ancient Israel or Palestine, as many times refer to it, he was a man. He was the man, Christ Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But as a man then, you see, he could pray to God the Father, and during those hours leading up to the cross, when he prayed that the Father would strengthen him, that the Father would be with him, those were truly prayers from the man, Christ Jesus. All right, And so it just became God. It was just part of his nature that he would bring about this tremendous plan of salvation. Now, I'm sure you all do like Iris and I do as, as we travel and we go through these populated areas and the cities of our country, and we can't judge hearts. We can't even begin to come close, but you can't help but wonder how many have ever considered this tremendous plan of salvation that's been offered free for nothing. I'm afraid not many. Even though we're in a nation where there are churches on every corner, Bibles in every home and uh, radio and television is blaring with people of one sort or another, proclaiming whatever they call it. And yet, how many people ever stop for a moment to consider spiritual things? I don't think very many anymore. And so, here we have to be aware then that the very nature of God, it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Now again, we always like to compare Scripture with Scripture. And even though it isn't that long ago we were in Thessalonians, I want to bring you back to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. No, Colossians. I'm sorry, honey. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And remember now what he's just telling the Hebrews, that it became him the God of creation, the one who made everything, the one who holds everything together. It's His. He didn't have to. My, He could have just let Adam and Eve go off into whatever and He could have started over or He could have just simply stayed with the angels. But it became Him to love these mortal creatures that he created there in the Garden of Eden. All right, in Colossians chapter 1, and again, we lose these verses over and over, but I think they bear repeating. Verse 15 and 16 and 17. Colossians 1, verse 15. Who, speaking of the Son, up there in verse 13, who is the image or the visible likeness of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. In other words, he was before anything that had ever been created. And here's why. Verse 16. For by him, the Son, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. In other words, nothing escapes His creatorship. And so all things were created by Him, and not just by Him, but what? For Him. He did it for His own enjoyment. He did it for Himself. But you see, as soon as He set man in the garden... Man goofed it, didn't they? 
And whereas Adam and Eve could have gone on enjoying that blissful state and with the Lord himself communing with them every day, they disobeyed and sin entered. But we have to constantly remember that even though God was great and powerful, the omnipotent, the creator, the sustainer of the universe, yet he immediately set in motion those tremendous wheels of redemption, which all led up, of course, to his own suffering and death to bring about mankind's salvation. All right, so now then coming back to verse 10 of Hebrews, so it just became God. It was just something that he couldn't help himself doing, even though he is the one that brought everything into being. He is the one by whom everything is held together. And by so bringing in this plan of redemption, he is bringing, now watch the word here, he is bringing many sons unto glory. Now the average reader is totally going to miss it. What does it mean when he says he is bringing them with him into glory? Well, it means simply that he left glory, <coughs> went down and cohabited with these creatures that he intended to save, and from their place on earth he is now what? Bringing them with him to glory. Do you get the picture? You know, I think, I think in one of the last programs, otherwise I used it in one of my classes here in Oklahoma, I was reminded of uh, a, a little anecdote, whatever you want to call it, of a gentleman who, there was an anthill back in the corner of his yard, and uh, periodically he liked to just go out and watch those ants with all their activity, and he would just stand and watch them. And one day as he was watching, he noticed that there was one poor little ant trying to get a piece of straw about an inch or so long, down into the ant hole. And of course it was too wide, and that poor little ant could not get that piece of straw down the hole. And so finally he couldn't take it any longer, so he got down on his knees and he was going to help that little ant put that straw down the hole. Well, you know what happened. The ants all scattered. And so again he stood there and in frustration, and his neighbor came along, and he says, what are you doing? Well, he says, I'm watching these ants. He said, they're interesting. But he said, there's one in particular that I want to help. He st every time I go down and try to help him, they all scatter. And yet as soon as I back away a little bit, that same little fellow picks up that same piece of straw and frantically tries to get it down into his den. And he says, it's just frustrating. And his neighbor said, well, the only way it'll ever work if you become an ant. Well, then the thought struck him, see? Isn't that exactly what God did? See, God knew that mankind could never understand who He is and what He's done, so He had to become one of us. And when He became one of us, then He was on that playing field where we can understand and we can, co uh, we can just so take a hold of all this. See? And so that's exactly what's implied here. The very God who was become to do this and by whom are all things, he went down and became part of the human race so that he could bring, him, bring them with him to glory. All right, now then you go right on into the next thought, and it's just as good, it's just as mind-boggling, that as he brings many sons, which of course is what Paul said, in fact, I guess we better compare Scripture with Scripture. Come back with me to Romans. Back to Romans, because when we use the word the sons here, we want to clarify it from Scripture. In uh, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. Romans chapter 8, and we'll begin with verse 14. In order to establish why does Paul say here in Hebrews, that Christ is bringing sons to glory. Romans 8, start at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now here it comes. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now the actual Greek there for the word children are born ones. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's where the Scottish term, barren, B-A-R-N, really originates from the born ones, that family relationship, see? Now verse 17, now then if we are the born ones, then we're heirs, and we're heirs of God, and we're joint heirs with Christ. But we don't want to leave the last part of that verse. Today no one likes to read something like this, but it's always been true that if we suffer with Him, then we may be glorified together or with Him. And so this is the whole concept then of the new birth that we become the born ones of God, we become children of God. All right, now then let's come back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 once again. So through the love of God that was expressed when He brought about the plan of redemption and salvation for all that He had died for, He went and became part of the human race. Now this is the whole crux of our salvation message, that the eternal, sovereign, creator God took on human flesh, submitted himself to the Roman authorities, and he suffered and died for us. All right, now then, as he is bringing many born ones unto glory, it is to make the captain of their salvation through, perfect, through suffering. Now, I want you to underline that word captain. The captain of our salvation. Now, it's the same Greek word translated in chapter 12, the author of our salvation. Same word. But here the concept is a file leader. That, that's the real definition of this word captain. Now, in my own mind, I have to go back and remember some of the Western movies where the cavalry were involved, and I can just remember seeing one particular, I wouldn't have any idea what movie it may have been in, but I can just see this file of, of the American cavalry going up this mountain, almost on a narrow ledge, single file. And they wound down around the mountain, all the way down to the plain. But who had to be at the head? A leader. There was a leader up at the head of that long line. Well, now, if that can help you a little bit, see, that's where Christ is. Christ is the file leader of all of us that He came down to earth to purchase the redemption, and now He's bringing us to glory. Now, can you just make a beautiful picture of that in your mind? I hope so. But then, you see, being the Pauline man that I am, what does Paul say? Be followers of me as I follow the file leader. See? All right, now let's come back and pick that up in Corinthians. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. I hope I'm right. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 11, verse 1. And just, just, just sort of envision this. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, I'm not a, a visualization uh, promoter or anything like that. But once in a while, these pictures that are drawn in Scripture, it just helps us to get a little glimpse of what it's talking about. Now, I've always said, as long as I've been teaching, you cannot find one single earthly illustration that will carry a spiritual illustration all to the end. It's impossible. In fact, it's just like the four Gospels. Why have we got four instead of one? Well, because, you see, all four of the four Gospels look at Christ from a different viewpoint, and one could have never done it. And it's the same way with earthly anecdotes. You cannot carry a theme from start to finish in the realm of the spiritual with an earthly anecdote. It's absolutely impossible. But it does help to put several of them together. All right, you got 1 Corinthians chapter 11? <coughs> chapter 11, verse 1. And look what the apostle writes. Now this, 
This angers people. I know it does. But it's what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. And it's just as appropriate for us today as it was the day he wrote it. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of who? Of Christ. See how plain that is? Now, when you come back then to Hebrews, and we get the picture how that the Lord himself left heaven's glory to come amongst human men and became a man that he might be the file leader of all these that he's bringing with him to glory. But for us as believers, the second man up there at the front is who? The Apostle Paul. And so Paul is following Christ as he's leading us up that file of believers to glory. He's following Christ. We follow Paul. And of course, the reason I always put that is that Paul was human like we are. He had the same temptations. He had the same failures. He had the same weaknesses, see? And consequently, we can identify with something like that. But never lose sight of the fact that when Christ finished that work of redemption, he became the captain, the file leader of those of us that he is bringing with him to glory. All right, now then the last part of the verse is that our salvation was made perfect through what? Through suffering. Through suffering. Now, where does that begin? Well, clear back in Genesis chapter 3. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve have just disobeyed. They have plunged the human race into sin and death, all because of the tempter, the devil, Satan. And so now in verse 14 and 15, the Lord, God the Son, of course, in His Old Testament personality, is confronting Satan, and look what he tells him. Now, this is the first promise of a line of the redemption from Genesis all the way up through the finished work of the cross. Genesis 3, verse 4, 15, where the Lord says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and of course, Christ is the seed of the woman. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head. In other words, Christ defeated Satan by crushing his head with his death, burial, and resurrection. But did Satan get his licks in? You bet he did. And here's the, the, the prophecy of it. And thou, the Lord says to Satan, shall bruise his heel. Well, what's implied? The suffering that Christ would go through in order to crush the head of Satan. And so we have this concept all the way up through Scripture that the righteous are going to suffer for their faith. And of course, Paul epitomizes that with the suffering that he went through in order to get the gospel to the ends of the Roman Empire. Now come back with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 8, where we just were a moment ago, but we stopped a verse short in Romans chapter 8. Verse 18, Romans 8, verse 18. Wait till you all find it. Romans 8, verse 18, where Paul writes, For I reckon that the suffering, see, the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the what? the glory. It's not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in or to us. Now, what's he talking about? Oh, we'll suffer in this earthly sojourn, but it's nothing compared with the glory that's awaiting us. Now, you know, every once in a while, some will write a question from the television audience concerning our eternal state. And I usually have to answer, I suppose people think it's a cop-out, but it's not, that the Scripture doesn't tell us very much about our eternal state. It's going to be glorious. 
and we know God alone knows how to make things perfect, but to be able to just lay out what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be operating, no, I can't do that because the Bible is silent. But we do have to constantly be reminded as we suffer for our faith. Now, of course, we in, in the Western world in the last couple hundred years have known almost nothing of suffering for our faith. We don't know what it is. Now, of course, there are places in Africa tonight, places in Indonesia where they are. They're suffering inexorably for their faith. But you and I have it so good that we really don't know what it is to suffer. We may have somebody make a snide remark once in a while and, uh, and those things, but, but that's not suffering. My goodness, that's, uh, that's something that just rolls off like water off a duck. But nevertheless, it has been part and parcel of the Christian experience down through the history of Christendom that people have had to suffer for their faith. Now, you see, even the Twelve, even the disciples, they all suffered a martyr's death. But, of course, none of them, I don't think, suffered as much as the Apostle Paul. And so he really knew what he was talking about. All right, so let's look at that verse once more before we go back to Hebrews. And so he says, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed to us. And so the suffering of this present time, of course, was precipitated by the curse. And since we're living under the curse, we can certainly expect to have a certain amount of suffering. Now, of course, we, we know that a lot of our listeners are, are suffering from, uh, well, I had one gentleman just call yesterday. Who, he and his wife have been in a terrible car wreck. And the suffering that he has had to go through and the surgeries that he still faces. We've had others that uh, suffered inexorably with terminal cancer and so forth. And yet, you know, it's amazing how almost in every instance when someone like that suffered, a family member was saved shortly later. And so always remember that God has his own purposes, that the sufferings that we sometimes endure, we don't understand personally. But God has a reason and he has a purpose for it. And uh, we are not to shrink from that. And all right, now we'll just wind up the few seconds that are left, repeating verse 10 again. So he has brought many sons to glory, back in Hebrews 2, verse 10, and he has become the captain of our salvation, and he perfected it through the suffering. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.